gonna make a change for once in my life. It's gonna feel real good, gonna make a difference, gonna make it right. As I turn up the collar on my favorite winter coat, this wind is blowing my mind. I see the kids in the street with not enough to eat. Who am I to be blind, pretending not to see their needs? A summer disregard, a broken bottle top, and a one-man soul. They follow each other on the wind, you know, because they got nowhere to go. That's why I want you to know. Starting with the man in the mirror, I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make a world a better place, then take a look at yourself and then make a change, yeah. Starting with the man in the mirror. That is my least favorite place to start. I don't know about anybody else. But uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about what that might have to do with repairing some of our relationships that have shattered along the way as we get to this morning's message. Uh, but first, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Andy. I'm on staff here. Welcome to Lake Oconee Church. And I'm so glad that you're here. Congratulations to everybody for navigating the time change successfully. There were only a handful of people here at 815. So uh, good job. I'm so proud. Uh, but uh, it is going to be weird at about four o'clock when it's dark. But hey, that's uh, the way it rolls. But uh, if you are our guest today, I'm so glad that you're here and a part of our service. And I don't want you to leave empty handed. So our guest service team has put together a gift that I'd love for you to take with you when you leave today. 
And you can grab that from the studio, which is the glass room you passed on the way in. So when you leave this morning, just swing by there. You can grab that gift quickly as you head out the door. And it's actually something I think you'll enjoy using during this week. So you'll definitely want to swing in there and grab that before you go. If you're our guest online, you can go to guest.lakeoconee.church and we'll email you something significant as well that you can enjoy during the course of this week. Well, over the next few minutes, we're going to continue with a couple of songs led by Shawnee and BJ and our band, and I'd love for you to sing with us as soon as you're comfortable doing that, and then we're going to jump into this morning's message, which will be brought to us by one of our teaching pastors, Andy Stanley, and then uh, as we wrap up the morning, I want to invite those of you who are newer to our church to stick around for a 15-minute event called Next, and Next will be held right here in this room. I'll be hosting it. I'd love to meet you there. And during those 15 minutes, we'll share some behind the scenes things about Lake Oconee Church so that you can be aware of what's here for you and for your family and maybe some ways that you might be able to explore getting connected uh, as soon as you're ready to do that. And as I said, it'll only last 15 minutes, but I'd love for you to be a part of that. So go ahead and plan now to stick around for that as we wrap up this morning. Well, I think that's everything you need to know. So if you would, stand to your feet, say hey to somebody near you, and we'll keep this morning going. Good morning, Lake Oconee. Hope you're doing well. We're going to be served a big, big God. There's no problem we have. This is too small for him. Let's believe it. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Yeah. There's nothing to fear now. believe this. So when I find, I'll find on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. In every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh, my God. Almighty fortress. Come on. You don't be. 
Cause I know you'll make a way And I don't always understand And I don't always get to see But I will believe it Yes, I will believe it Cause you make mountains move You make giants fall And you use songs of praise To shake prison walls And I will speak to my fear I will preach to my doubt That you were faithful then You'll be faithful now as I go through my life and I hit those moments of tension and frustration and questions, what we just sang is one of the reasons that my faith still has confidence. Because I know that in the most difficult moments of my life that I have repeatedly seen our Heavenly Father show up. Not necessarily in the ways that I wanted or would have preferred, but I've seen him show up over and over and over again. And it gives me confidence to know that if he showed up then, then he most certainly is dependable to show up now. And I know for some of us, we would say, yeah, that's exactly where I find myself. And, and I can sing that song with my whole heart because that's exactly how I feel. And I know for others of us, we're not there yet. Or maybe we used to be, but we're, we're wavering and we're struggling and we're asking questions. And I want you to know that that is okay. In fact, that's why we created this place. To be a place where we could investigate faith, where we could ask our questions, where we could trust fully, and where we could lean on someone else's trust in those moments that we waver. 
We wanted it to be a place that inspired us to follow Jesus in our everyday lives, even in the moments where we have questions and struggles and even doubts. And it's why I want to say thank you to those of you who have an intentional, purposeful plan for how you give sacrificially and generously to our church, to our mission. And whether you do that through the buckets that are in the back of the room, by the doors, if you've ever seen those as you walk out, that's what those are for. Or maybe you've given online through give.lakeaconey.church. Maybe you've never explored that, but it's a way that you can be a part of our mission of inspiring people to follow Jesus. And I just want to say thank you for the many of you who have chosen to do that purposefully and intentionally. Well, over the next few minutes, we're going to hear this morning's message. And if you've been here more than a couple of weeks, you know that around here we have a variety of speakers. Sometimes they're right here on our stage, right here in front of us. And at other times, they're live on stage at another campus. And this morning, we're going to be hearing from Andy Stanley. He's live on stage in Alpharetta today. And he's going to be bringing us part three of our series, Reassembly Required, all about a beginner's guide for repairing broken relationships. But before we get there, as one of your pastors living here in Georgia's Lake Country, I'd love to take a minute to pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you supersede our doubts because your character is strong. Your character is consistent. And you have been faithful in our journey and in the journey of many, many people that have come before us. And God, remind us of that when we start to question, when we start to waver, when we start to doubt. And God, I pray that the stories of so many that sit in this room and join us online of how you have showed up will be incredibly encouraging for us in those moments where we question, where we get hesitant. And God, as we dive in today and we begin to talk about relationships, and God, for all of us, there are relationships that we value that have gone in directions we wouldn't have chosen. And God, I pray that what we learn today as we learn more about you, as we learn learn more about how you see us, and more about what a Jesus follower looks like in our day-to-day lives, God, I pray that you would spark within us a desire to live that relationship out, even in the closest of our connections with other people. I pray that you would just guide us over these next few minutes in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I was raised to believe, and you may have been raised differently, I was raised to believe that the man in the relationship is ultimately responsible for the relationship, although we are generally terrible at relationships. I got a woo on that. I don't know if that's a woo line, but anyway, um, that was supposed to be, I I needed sympathy. Anyway, so um, the way I internalized this, and this was probably just me, the way I internalized this I took it to mean that if anything, if anything goes wrong in the relationship, that ultimately, somehow, it's my fault. And I say somehow because sometimes it takes me a few minutes to figure out how it's my fault, but I kind of go into it assuming it's my fault. So in our relationship, it sounds kind of like this. Sandra says, Andy, I'm so sorry, or I didn't tell you about this, or I'm so sorry. And, I, and, I, and my immediate response is, well, I mean, it's, it's probably my fault. <laughs> and she's like, how could that possibly be your fault? I'm like, well, I don't know yet. Just, just give me a second, you know? <laughs> but if I think long enough, and then, 
and I may have shared this with you before, when I just can't figure out how it's my fault, this is what I default, this is my default. I say, if I hadn't asked you to marry me in the first place, this would have never happened. Yeah, now, uh, just to be clear, um, especially if you're just joining us, I'm not giving marriage advice, so this isn't like no elbows and, you know, you know, you know this, is just, this is just me. And the, the reason I bring it up, and by the way, Sandra thinks this is great, I, I should say, um, um, but the reason I bring it up is simply this, that given enough time, given enough time, there's always a way, if you, if you give yourself enough time, there's always a way to sneak yourself um, a slice of the blame pie. In any relationship, when there's a falling out or when it's, it may have fallen out years ago, it may be something recent, there's, there's always a way to slice yourself, um, find yourself a slice of the blame pie, even if it's a little bitty, tiny little slice, right? Because in every relational conflict, whether it's, you know, mother, son, you know, mother, daughter, you know, husband, wife, um, aunts, and, you know, your distant aunt and your uncle and the person who ruined Christmas, whatever it might be, whenever there's a conflict, um, somebody is to blame. And because you're fabulous, it's rarely ever you, right? I mean, it's not your fault, it's their fault. But if your goal, and this is what we've been talking about for the past few weeks, if your goal is to get back to them and not get back at them, at some point, you better find yourself or try to find yourself a slice of the blame pie. Maybe something that looks more like this, a, a, a larger slice of the blame pie. Okay, now today, if you haven't been with us or if you're just watching online for the first time in a long time, uh, we're in part three of a series entitled Reassembly Required. Reassembly Required, a beginner's guide. It's just a beginner's guide. There's a lot we're not gonna cover. A beginner's guide to repairing broken relationships because we are better at starting relationships and maintaining relationships than we are at fixing them when they break. And as we've said throughout this series, when there's a break, when there's a tension, when there's a gap, when there's a crack, when there's a conflict, um, when there's a breach, either recently, I mean, it could have been this morning or maybe years ago, um, we generally employ management principles. So I introduced us to the C4 approach to relationship management. You know, convince, I'm just gonna give you information and convince you that I'm right. Um, convict, you know, after all I've done for you, after all the opportunities I've given you, coerce and control, we generally go for these management tools and we attempt to manage the relationship back to health. <laughs> and at the end, we manage to make things worse, right? And then when these tools don't work and we just generally go for them, when they don't work, we're just frustrated. I'm just frustrated with her, frustrated with him, frustrated with them. I'm just, I'm just frustrated. And I'm frustrated because, you know, I, I sort of feel locked out um, and so I shut down. Some of you just shut down because you're, you know, some of us express, some of us are more internal, I'm more internal. I shut down because I feel shut out, right? And then we start making excuses. And we all do this, we start making excuses. And there are three in particular that we go to when the relationship's broken, either just broke, just had that argument, or maybe it was weeks ago or months ago, and maybe you're still in the same house and you're, everybody's just kind of pouting their way around, waiting for the other person to, you know, to acknowledge their blame or acknowledge their part in the conflict. But there's generally three things we go to when we're trying to excuse the fact that we're not to blame or that we're not responsible for what happened. And, and the first one is so insidious. I thought about spending a whole week just talking about this one because it's such a big deal. But here are, here are the places that we go. Here are the excuses we make, three excuses. Number one, the first one is this, I don't even care. Well, I don't care. Nah, I just don't care. And here's how we say it or think it. I don't care anymore. I used to care, but then something happened. I've given up and I don't care anymore. Now, this is so important, okay? So this, is, this may be why you're watching or, or here today. Here's the thing. When you hear yourself say, I don't care, or I don't care anymore, or when you catch yourself thinking, you're driving to work, you're driving home, I just don't care anymore. You need to pay really close attention to that. And here's why. Because I don't care is often what we say about things we actually care deeply about. When we say, I don't care, it's actually oftentimes, that's an indication this is something you actually care deeply about. You just don't know what to do about it. It may mean I'm powerless. I'm powerless to do, powerless to do anything about, about it, but I wish I could. Things, this is so important, things we can't do anything about, but we wish we could are actually things we care deeply 
about. But when we feel like I'm just stuck, it's stuck, he's stuck, she's stuck, the whole thing's stuck, it's always gonna be stuck. There's, there's just something in all of us that just wants to throw up our hands and we excuse it by saying, I just don't care. But here's the thing, when that connection gets lost, and here's what I mean by that connection. I'm so angry with you. I'm so frustrated about the fact you won't take responsibility for what we did. The relationship's been awkward and it's broken. And now I've decided, you know what? I just don't care anymore. Here's what happens. When we lose sight of that relationship, the energy or the anger or the frustration or the bitterness, whatever you wanna call it, maybe a little, maybe a lot, that doesn't go away. When I decide, oh, I just don't care. I just take that energy with me somewhere else. And it generally ends up spilling out on somebody else. And relationally, we don't mean to do this. Nobody does this on purpose. Relationally, we become our own worst enemy. So when you hear yourself saying, I just, I just, I just don't care. Yes, you probably do. And you need to pay attention to that. The second, the second excuse is not quite as insidious as, well, I already tried. I already tried. Well, did you call her? Yes, I called. She didn't call me back. I, I already tried. I already tried. I already tried means I'm done. I'm done. I, I forgave her. I'm gonna forgive him. I'll forgive them. But you know what? I'm done. And that's understandable. But as we've said throughout this series, when it comes to reassembling a relationship, when it comes to fixing or repairing a relationship, the goal, remember this, the goal is no regrets. The goal is knowing that throughout, you know, the, the, the time that there was even any potential for reconciling throughout my relationship with that person, maybe throughout your whole life, that, that I kept the door open, that I kept the drawbridge down, that I kept the welcome mat out, that repairing a relationship or reassembling a relationship, it's really a posture. It's an attitude. And it is certainly, as everybody <laughs> knows, it's a process. And, it, and it's why the first decision we talked about, we talked about this last time we were together, this why our first um, reassembly relationship is so important. And if you're just joining us for the series, just catch up real quick. We said there are four decisions that we all have to make anytime we wanna repair a relationship. Anytime you wanna reassemble a relationship, again, something that's been broken a long time or a short time, there are four decisions we have to make. And the first decision we have to make is this, I'm deciding to get back to, not get back at. I'm, I'm, just, I'm deciding to get back to, it may take a long time, it may never happen, but I'm deciding to get back to, I'm not going to get back at. I'm not punishing, I'm pursuing. And when we throw up our hands and say, I've already tried, I've already tried, I've already tried, essentially what we're saying is, I'm not pursuing anymore. I'm not gonna work toward getting back to. I already tried and I'm done. The third excuse, and this sets us up for where we're going today, where we started is, well, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. I mean, why, why should I put effort into this when uh, really it was not my fault? And this, this is how all of our internal narratives go when there's been a break in a relationship, right? This is how it always ends. We rehearse our story in our minds. And then at the end of the story, the moral of the story is, it wasn't my fault. It was him, it was her, it was them. And of course, they're rehearsing a similar narrative, but we'll talk about them in just a minute. And it may be true that it's not your fault. It, it may be true that it's 100% their fault, but that's beside the point. Because when it comes to reassembling a relationship, when it comes to repairing or fixing a relationship, the reassembly, we talked about this last time, it always begins with us, regardless of who initiated the fuss that blame is an issue and blame is a topic for discussion, but blame is not an excuse to back out or to bail out on the process. And here's why, you're gonna hate this, okay? Because the healthiest person in the relationship and the most mature person in the relationship, the healthiest person and the most mature person is the one that should make the first move. And I know this about you, you are the healthiest and the most mature person in that relationship, aren't you? Yes, I finally got one honest person out here. It's like, yeah, I come to think of it. Yeah, my sister-in-law, you know, I am just more, I'm more mature. The problem with being so mature and you're also mature and the problem with being so responsible and you're also responsible is that it sets you up and positions you to make the first move regardless of who's to blame. 
This is, this is the, you know, I think I'd rather be the most immature person or the weakest person if that's what's on me. It's why, and, and this is how this intersects with, you know, what we're, why we're talking about this in church. It's why your heavenly father made the first move. For while we were still sinners, hopeless, separated from God, he said, you know what? Somebody's got to make a move and I am the most mature person in the relationship. So I'm going to make the first move. While we were still sinners, he sent his son to die for us, not just take us out to coffee and have a conversation, had to you know, shed his blood in order to repair this relationship. And he's for God so loved the world that he made the first move and he moved in our direction and he sent Jesus. And hey, maybe this is something you need to hear. He sent Jesus not to get back at you. He sent Jesus in order to get back to you. And then he invited us to do the same thing for the people around us. And he said, hey, you're my follower. I want you to do what I did. Even though you're almost blameless, I want you to make the first move. To which you would say, have you heard the story? <laughs> Your heavenly father's like, heard it. I was there for the whole thing. And I still want you to make the first move because I want you to do for others what I, through your savior, have done for you. And to ensure that we do, <laughs> Jesus, this is amazing, to ensure that we do, in other words, to ensure that we don't use other people's behavior as an excuse to bail on the process, Jesus comes to us through the scripture and he asks us a very irritating question. In fact, he asks all of us this irritating question. If you're not a Jesus follower or a Christian or even a religious person, I think this question is for you as well. And you may have heard this before and didn't know it came from the lips of Jesus. So Jesus says to us, okay, I, I know I get the situation. It's probably not your fault. It's almost not, you know, I, I get it. I, I was there. I, I've got the details, but I just, I just want to ask you this question. Why? Why? Why, why do you look at the speck of sawdust and your brother, your sister, your neighbor, your boss, your ex, your you know, partner, your, um, you know, your business partner. Why, why, why do you look at this speck of sawdust and that other person's eye and you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? In other words, here's what Jesus is asking. It's so irritating. Why are you so focused on what they did that you can't do anything about and you've given almost no attention at all to what you did that you can do something about. Why would you not acknowledge your part? To which we respond, because we all have an answer to this question. In fact, if I were to ask you this question, you didn't know it was coming from Jesus, you wouldn't even be respectful when you answered the question, right? But Jesus is asking it, not me. And we all have an answer to this question. And the answer is, well, Jesus, let me answer your question. First of all, it's not, a speck of sawdust in their eye. They left, they lied, they ruined Christmas again. She brought him again, he brought her again. They stirred it up again. They brought that topic up again. They were unfair to me again. They stole my idea again. They did not give me the promotion I deserved again. They lied. I mean, this isn't a speck of sawdust. This isn't, Jesus, I mean, come on. This isn't a little thing. This is a big thing. Those are not specks of sawdust, okay? Secondly, I don't have a plank in my eye, okay, right? I don't have a plank in my eye. Okay, I'm not perfect. I realize I'm talking to God, okay? But I, I realize I'm not perfect, but I did not start this. I didn't start this fire. I didn't cause this. I didn't create this. She did, he did, they did. And so, you know, I see very clearly what's going on and I see very clearly what happened and the way I see it is the way it happened. And if they're ever able or willing to see things the way I see them, I'm around, okay? I mean, I, I'm waiting. I mean, yeah, my arms are crossed most of the time, but I see this as it ends. So, so, so no offense, Jesus, but are we done here? I mean, you know, thanks for asking the question, but it's not a speck, it's a big deal. It's not a plank. I see clearly. To which Jesus says, I got a second question. How? How can you say to that person, your brother, your sister, the person at work, your neighbor, your friend, how can you say, permit me to take the speck out of your eye? In other words, because I mean, this is, I mean, it's like he's read our mind. He certainly understands relationships. How can you say, or how can you even think, hey, if you'll come over here and sit down, I'll fix you. 
Allow me to fix you. Allow me to correct you. Allow me to help you see what happened the way it actually happened. Allow me to help you see clearly what happened between us because I see clearly what happened between us. And Jesus says, okay, wait, before you rush to conclusions, how do you know? How, how, how is it you're so certain that you see clearly? And isn't it true? We think we do. Whenever we tell our story, our sad story, or explain our situation to somebody else, they're like, yeah, I, yeah, I get it. You're, you're, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. Isn't it true that we think we see clearly? And here's Jesus' point. It's so great. Jesus' point is this. You have things out of order. You have things out of order. You're, you're, you're not ready. You may not see as clearly as you think you do. You may have some more work to do. How can you say, how can you say to your brother, permit me, permit me to take the speck out of your own eye when all the time, this whole time, there's a plank in your own eye. Now, this is really interesting. The, the English phrase all the time is actually one Greek word. And it's a play on words that we can't pick up on in English. So, so literally what this text would say is this, how can you say to your brother, permit me to take the speck out of your own eye when behold, looky there, there is a plank in your own eye. In fact, to make it more colloquial, this is exactly what it would look like. When looky there, will you? This is exactly what Jesus is saying. Well, what do you know? Well, looky there. Well, oh my goodness, surprise, surprise. There is a plank in your eye and the plank in your eye is making it difficult for you to see things the way things actually are in the relationship. Then he smiles, I think. And he says, you hypocrite, you hypocrite. <laughs> I love that this term, it's, it's um, hypocrites. It's where we get the word hypocrite. It's the Greek term, hypocrites. You actor, you pretender. So we back up and say, okay, Jesus, let me see if I got this straight. <clears throat> so let me, okay. So what you're saying is um, I've got my own issues and they've got their own issues. And I should focus on my issues and let them focus on their issues. So I, I get it, Jesus. What you're saying is, is that I should mind my own business, right? And Jesus says, no, that's not the point of this teaching. This is a lesson about reconciliation. Reconciliation, the point I'm making is that you start with your own business, but you don't end with your own business. He says, you hypocrites, First, so he adds a word, first. In other words, we're not done here. There's a process first and just heads up, there's gonna be a second. First, he says, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta take the plank out of your own eye. That is, you've gotta pause and identify your slice of the blame pie. And it may be a little tiny sliver, but before you can get back to and to keep yourself from slipping into get back at, the first thing you have to do, he even says, first. He's not saying there's not a speck in their eye. He's not saying there's not a plank in your eye. He's saying for the relationship to work and for you, this process to work and for you to be able to do the will of your heavenly father, first, you gotta own your slice of the pie. And it may take a minute. Now, if you don't think God answers prayer, and I gave you a prayer last time that if you don't think God answers prayer, pray that one, but here's another one. If you don't think God answers prayer, I dare you to pray this one. Heavenly Father, you've seen the pie. And if there is anything that I'm responsible for, Heavenly Father, if, there's, if there is a slice of this that I should own, would you please show me what it is? And God will answer that prayer. It's hard to pray. It's scary to pray. Before you finish the first sentence, a slice of pie is going to come to mind. It's hard to pray because especially when it's mostly their fault, they, it really is mostly their fault. So the whole idea that I would even pause long enough and try to find the emotional bandwidth to take, it, you know, to, to take credit or not credit, but you know, to take responsibility for something in a relationship that is so obviously their fault, this is hard to pray. But here's what your savior says. You wanna move toward rather than get back at? You wanna get back to rather than get back at? You wanna be like me? You wanna follow me? 
then you've got to find your slice of the pie, however small it might be. And you've got to own it. And here's the next thing. Jesus says, and I'll make you a promise because Jesus makes a promise. If we are humble enough, if we are self-aware enough, if we are courageous enough, if we are sensitive to the Spirit's nudging when we begin to ask that difficult question and pray that difficult prayer, he said, this is what I'll do. I will allow you to see clearly. I will allow you to see clearly. I will allow you to perhaps see the relationship and the breach in the relationship and the break in the relationship in a way that you haven't seen it before, which makes sense because if you have something in your eye and you remove it, you see more clearly. But there's not a period at the end of clearly because he's not quite finished because he said there was a first and here's the second. Following Jesus, this is the point. Following Jesus, following Jesus never stops with what's in it for me. This is why I can't just mind my own business and let you mind your own business. I'm just gonna work on me, you just work on you and we're done. Following Jesus never ends with me and it never ends with you. And recognizing and removing what's in my eye isn't, a, isn't specifically or even primarily about me. It's about somebody else. It's about something else. So he says, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. That, that recognizing, recognizing and removing what's in my eye, recognizing and removing what's in my eye prepares me to move towards you. It's not even about me being a better person. It's not even about me, oh, you know, I did do something wrong. God, forgive me. Are we good to go? Oh, I'm so glad my conscience is cleared. I'm so glad I prayed that prayer. He's like, no, forgiveness is just half the equation. I didn't stop with forgiveness. God says, I forgave you and moved in your direction. I want you to forgive, right? And I want you to apologize. And I, but I'm, I'm for something even bigger than that. I want you to live with no regrets. And if possible, I want that, rec- I want that relationship to be reconciled. And recognizing and removing what's in your eye allows you to move with a clearer conscience and with clearer vision toward the other person, not to get back at them, but to get back to them or to say it a different way. If there's something about me that's an obstacle to us, if there's something about me that I discover that's an obstacle to us, I've got to cut myself a slice of the blame pie. And identify it, admit it, own it, remove it. And this is hard. It's hard because self-righteousness, self-righteousness always gets in the way. Self-righteousness always gets in the way. Self-awareness, this is what Jesus is calling us to, paves the way. So restoring or reassembling a relationship requires decisions, four decisions. The first one we talked about, I will get back to, not get back at. You gotta decide this up front. Otherwise you'll cross your arms and you will subtly just try to get back at. I will get back to, I will not get back at. In other words, I'm gonna take payback off the table. And the second decision, the decision we're talking about today is this one. I will own my slice of the blame pie. I will identify my slice of the blame pie. As much as I'm sure it is not my fault and none of it's my fault, as painful as what they did was to me, as much as it hurt me, as much as anybody hears my story and goes, what a complete whatever, whatever, whatever he or she was. Regardless, to pause long enough and to say, Heavenly Father, if there is anything in my eye that is keeping me from seeing them clearly, seeing them the way you see them clearly and seeing the situation clearly, I want to know and I'll deal with it and I'll own it because I wanna see the relationship clearly, not just for my sake, but for the sake of the relationship. For some of us, it's kind of easy because the situation that comes to mind isn't that big a deal. For some of you, for some of us, it's been years. It, it's, it's so emotional and you're, they're so shut down, you're so shut down, you're so sure, they don't even, they don't even wanna talk to you. This, this seems important for somebody, but not you, it almost seems irrelevant. So I would just encourage you to do what Jesus is asking us to do, to at least say, God, Heavenly Father, if there's a part, regardless of how small, 
I don't wanna live the rest of my life looking there before I first look here. And I'll remove it from my eye. I'll take the pie out of my eye so I can see the relationship more clearly. The Apostle Paul summarized it this way. We're gonna come back to this verse next week. Um, I wanted to kind of put it out there for you. In fact, I would encourage you to memorize this verse. This is a verse maybe you put on your dashboard or your mirror or somewhere. It's just a reminder, especially if you're kind of wrestling with a relationship. We'll kind of tease it out some more next week. But here's what he writes. He says, if it, if it is possible, because sometimes it's not. I mean, he's a realist. If it is possible, and then he adds this phrase, as far as it depends on you, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, in other words, if there's anything you can do, be at peace with everyone. Be at peace with everyone. You can't control whether or not they are at peace with you. But if there's anything you can do, if there's anything I can do that removes that, that angst that I live with constantly, and that I can be at peace. He says, as far as it depends on you, you do whatever you need to do to get to the place where you are at peace with you as it relates to the people around you. And addressing and owning my part of the blame pie, that depends on me. That depends on me. Reconciliation, what he's saying, this is hard. Regardless of what's happened, reconciliation, whether it actually happens or not, but the process always begins in the mirror. It begins with, and this goes back to what Jesus said, that's why his words are so powerful. It actually begin, it begins with me doing what I hope and pray they will do. In fact, while I'm speaking today, or maybe during this series, some of you were thinking, I sure wish, and a name came to mind, hears this. I sure wish so-and-so heard this. In fact, you're sitting here thinking, how can I get this message to them without knowing that I sent it to them? Because this is what they need to hear because their piece of the pie is so stinking big and everybody knows that piece of the pie is so big except them. How can I get them to hear this? How can I get them to see this? How can I get them to do this? Because they need to do this. And if that's your thought process, and come on, we're, we're, we're all guilty of that from time to time. Here's, again, this takes us back to what that awful word that Jesus called us that's so offensive. In fact, some of you are offended at me because you feel like I said it to you. But let's be honest, if we, if we aren't willing to do what we're convinced they should do, I mean, if I'm not willing to own my little bitty slice, even though we think the rest of it belongs to them, if I'm not willing to do what I hope they will do, if I'm not willing to do what I pray they will do, if I'm not willing to do what for years I thought they should do, if I'm not willing to do what seems common sense to me that they should do, then Jesus is right. I'm a hypocrite because I expect more of them than I do of myself. And this is the brilliance of Jesus' teaching because we feel like I don't have a plank, I have a speck. They're the ones with the plank. And Jesus says, it just depends on how you look at it. And the moment you've heard what I just taught, Jesus would say, and the moment you decide you're not going to do it, you've become just like them. Not in terms of the slice of the pie, the size of the slice of the pie, but in terms of our response to our guilt, our response to our responsibility and why the relationship broke to begin with. When we discover a log, plank, a sliver, or a speck. When it's safe, it's not always safe. If it's appropriate, sometimes it's not appropriate. But when we realize, yep, I've got a slice and I have never owned that, that's our cue to move in their direction, not to blame and not to force a relationship they may not want, but at least to acknowledge to them, you know what? Here's where I was at fault. This is when you write that letter. This is when you send that email. This is when you make that phone call. This may be when you sit down and have coffee because we go first, like our savior went first because Jesus followers go first. And here's the thing, and maybe you've experienced this, but here's what I know from personal experience and just experience in terms of what I do as a pastor. It could be, and we can't even imagine this happening, but it could be that when you are willing to humble yourself and own whatever responsibility in the conflict you can own and take full responsibility for it, you may unlock something in them that they don't know how to unlock by themselves. 
because nobody is intuitively that good at fixing a relationship. They're stuck and your humility and your willingness to move in their direction may give them the, mo the emotional margin they need to acknowledge something they've never been able to acknowledge or weren't even sure how to. So your humility may do something in them and for them, and that's not why you're moving in their direction, but you never know what you might accomplish in them through your humility, because humility, relationally speaking, is the most powerful dynamic. They may, they may need you to make the first move. Here's something I've learned, and I've shared this with you before, but just to kind of wrap it up. <clears throat> the more aware I am, speaking for me personally, the more aware I am of what God has yet to do in me, I have lots of slices of lots of pies, the more aware I am, the more cognizant I am, the, 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 more, the more willingness I have, you know, from time to time to acknowledge that stuff I don't wanna acknowledge, the more aware I am, I am I have of what God has yet to do in me, the less aware I am and the less consumed I am by what he has yet to do in the people around me. That the more time I spend in the mirror saying, God, cleanse my heart. God, help me to see this the way you see it. God, help me to see them. This is why we, I gave you that prayer last time. God, help me to see him, her, the way you see him, her. Help me to see the situation the way you see it. Help me to see my part. God, just you work on me because God, you're the only person, I, I'm the only person we can do anything about. The more aware I am, the more aware you are of what God has yet to do in you, the less consumed you will be by what God has yet to do and the people around you. And I realize when you're deeply hurt, this is very, very difficult. But when you are deeply hurt, it is more necessary. It is more important because part of your healing and part of your ability to move on in a healthy way is to own it, to own it, to recognize it, to get forgiveness for it so that you can see more clearly how to move in their direction, if it's appropriate, if it's safe, if it's the thing you know you need to do. So there's four decisions we've talked about too. Decision number one, I'm gonna get back to, not get back at. Remember we said, remember we said, the goal is not reconciliation because you don't have control over all the pieces. The goal, the goal is simply to make sure that you live with no regret. And secondly, I will own my slice of the blame pie. I will own my slice of the blame pie. I'm gonna ask my heavenly father, father, I can't even imagine there's anything I'm responsible for in this, or maybe you have imagined it, but you've just not looked at it because their slice is so much bigger. But to say, heavenly father, give me eyes to see what's in my eye. Give me eyes to see what's blocking my vision. Give me eyes to see so that I can see clearly so that if the opportunity ever arises and if the opportunity ever comes my way, I can with the right attitude in humility lean in their direction and perhaps something I say, something I offer, something I do will unlock in them what needs to be unlocked so that they can move toward me. Imagine, and it's hard to imagine, imagine if everyone in our community, imagine if everyone in your family, imagine if everyone in our nation just hit pause and just took an honest look in the mirror. Because after all, <laughs> the person in the mirror is the only person you can do anything about. And the person in the mirror is the only person you can do anything about. And the person in the mirror is the only person I can do anything about. So let's follow Jesus and let's go first and let's pick it up right there next time as we wrap up our series, Reassembly Required. It's just a beginner's guide. It's just a beginner's guide to repairing broken relationships. Before you go, as you might imagine, three questions to keep the conversation going or to get a conversation started with your small group or maybe around lunch if that's a safe place. Um, question number one, it is difficult, is it difficult for you, this is almost a you know, silly question, is it difficult for you to admit you're wrong you're like, well, isn't it difficult for everyone? Probably, but the, the, the kicker is why? Why is it so difficult? Number two, what is the most, and, and if you're a parent and this is, or a grandparent, this is huge because these are the, these are the stories your children and grandchildren need, children need to hear from you. Because again, 
Um, reassembling a relationship is a learned skill and sometimes we need to see it modeled and sometimes we just need to hear a story. So what is the most difficult relationship you've ever had to repair and what did you learn from that experience? What is the most difficult relationship you've ever had to repair? How did you do it and what did you learn? And is, and is there something for the next generation in your family to learn from it so that history doesn't repeat itself? And then number three, would you be willing to commit Romans 12, 18 to memory? This is the verse I just read. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on me, live at or be at peace with everyone. Would you commit that to memory? Because sometimes, as we've seen, sometimes reconciling depends more on us than we're willing or want to admit. Forgiveness is important, but to forgive and to stand like this is not what your heavenly father would have you do. Sometimes reconciliation requires more of us than we're willing to put into it. It requires forgiveness, but it requires leaning in. It's always awkward, it's always emotional, but as far as it depends on you, would you be willing to do whatever you can do to create peace and to live at peace and to be at peace with the people around you like your heavenly father did with you? Let's pray together. Father, this is much easier to talk about than to walk out of here and do. And wherever this lands with us, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and the courage to do? Father, I pray for the man or woman, the student, the single, the married, the senior adult, who their falling out with you was because of a falling out with a Christian. Would you give them, even in this moment, eyes to see the way that relationship should be seen. And I pray that we who fall short so many times would never, ever, ever be a stumbling block to somebody who's moving in your direction. So Father, give us the courage to act. Give us the wisdom to know if we should act. And give us the humility, I pray, to ask you, okay, what is my part? What was my role? What is my slice of the pie? And I pray all of that in Jesus' name. Owning our part of the blame pie, that's not a comfortable thing. It's difficult to even talk about, let alone think about, and certainly difficult to act on. But what if we did? What if, as Jesus followers, we went first? I hope that you'll give thought to that this week. Think through some of those tense moments that have come to mind during the course of this series and prayerfully consider, what does it look like to own my slice? And I hope that you'll plan to come back next week as we wrap up this series, share this series with somebody else, uh, encourage them to binge watch it, and then invite them to come sit alongside you as we process it together uh, as we jump into next week. And if you're our guest, don't forget to swing by the studio and pick up your gift on the way out. And for anybody newer to Lake Oconee Church, I'd love for you to stick around for 15 minutes right here in this room. We'll keep on watching your kids. I'd love to meet you and uh, we'll talk through next uh, during that 15-minute event, answer some of your questions. I'd love for you to be a part of that. But uh, we'll start that in one minute. And for all of us, I look forward to seeing you here next week. Take care.